Good evening, Jordan. <clears throat> oh, my goodness, you're right on time. We are in the process of going live on YouTube. And uh, so let's see. I can see you. You can see me. I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can. Cool. All right. So we are going to work for about an hour tonight. Uh, we're going to work on the structure of the unconscious. And uh, let me just say good evening to our YouTube group. Good evening, YouTube group. And, Everybody. Uh, and so let's see. Okay, so we're going to start tonight by uh, looking at the image of the unconscious as developed by Edward Edinger. And the reason for that is that's the best one I've seen. And uh, so I'm going to share my screen. And this is the structure of the unconscious according to Edinger. Now, what he says is that you've got your ego floating up on top of the whole thing and your shadow is shadowing down underneath that uh and that would be the case for all all egos but uh for the, the purpose of sim simplicity uh that's not shown here and then a female a woman's ego runs through the animus into the self whereas a man's ego runs through the anima into the self and so then in the self uh we have the part of you that drives everything that you actually do and uh, so it has a personal manifestation but it also appears in history uh, we we see uh, the self in history uh, and what that looks like in terms of, for example, national characters, that sort of thing. And we see it as a world, something even deeper, which is all human beings. And finally, we see it as space-time itself. And so all of these things come together in the self uh, from the personal manifestation to the uh, sort of global manifestation. Jordan, do you want to comment on that before we move on? Yeah, and I've, I've started to look at this. Um, I, I don't disagree with it in the least, but with anima and animus to try to get away from the male female, I, I get what's happening here, but I do feel that the anima is more associated with the creative drive. And then the animus is more associated with strategy or authority. And I think that Uranus would be then the creative drive, the freedom from knowing as it were. And then Saturn, the, you know, structure, the one sitting in the, um, traditionalist kind of throne would be the animus. So I, I think that, in, in that, with my work currently with things I'm writing on, I'm also looking at how the anima is, is more directed to creative drive and the animus more to the authority and right. the structure. So and, in a sense, you get the structure and, and the animus and the content, as it were, in the anima. And I, I, I'm, I'm enjoying playing with how those two interact in a similar way to make it maybe more abstract or less abstract. I'm still not sure yet where it's going, but it, uh, to playing with those two ideas along with these. Well, we have to keep in mind also that uh, the woman's ego also has the creative drive, okay? So up above the anima, women naturally, because they tend to be more intuitive, um, tend to be more creative and to find something to build out of not much, as a matter of fact. Um, and so women are typically creative. They're creating dinner 
uh, for tonight. Uh, my lovely wife made dinner for me. Uh, I often create uh, omelets for her in the morning, not during the school week anymore. But um, but anyway, the uh, the atom represent within a man represents that feminine part that is creative. Whereas in a woman, the woman is already creative. The man is, uh, and the man, on the other hand, is Saturnine, like you suggest. And the woman, on, on the other hand, has to get her masculine uh, from an unconscious sort of lens that goes over the, the self. Um, I'll, I'll go with that. And I also, you know, we kind of teach what we most need to learn that I look at when I look at kids, for example, um, at about age seven, they moved from the mom to the dad. I mean, it was a patriarchy. So we have the male, so to speak, in charge in that place. But if it was a matriarchy, they would move from the dad to the mom. But around six, five or six, if you put what I've noticed, if there are three little girls together, then shortly there will be a tea party. I mean, right. it's, it's Insta structure. I mean, they just, the strategy and that goes together. If one little girl is more towards a, in charge, um, then she'll dismiss the one that's overloading her. But mm -hmm. if you get three little boys about the same age, five or six, They'll play catch as catch can until they are hyper tired, emotional balls of wrecks and fall down in tears. And that's more emotional. And so what I find is that then the roles are typically taught in reverse of that. And the women are told not to be strat strategists and the men are told not to be emotional. So they look at each other and go, oh, well, you have you've been doing the tea party thing. I think I'll. I don't mean politically. I mean, just like girls and people at the table with tea. Um, but then the boys look over, oh, we'll, we'll play with the strategy. And the girls turn over and we'll play with the emotion. And so I find that there is kind of a, a crisscross that's going on early on. And I don't, I'm not in any way set that that is natural or in any way immutable, you know, like a, a natural piece that, oh, well, that's, that's the truth. I think it's just a developmental phase. Right. Um, but so interestingly enough, I think coming back to this, it's um, I think in general, this diagram really expresses that each the male and the female deal with an inner other. And the other is the end in that, you know, the enantiodromia of the opposite yeah. or the, the other end of the spectrum. Yeah. So that the there's man a is, is masculine he'll be feminine on the inside in his anima. Whereas if, if he's too masculine, uh, he's really feminine <laughs> on the inside. Well, and, yeah, actually what's interesting is if you take that and say, say someone's quote unquote too masculine, i.e. machismo, that, that's usually a big indicator that they are terrified little children on the inside. Yep. And so there's the duck and cover on the outside so that no one sees that they really aren't very comfortable. And then when women, you know, same thing, too terrified, and they'll become too authoritarian because they're protecting themselves. You know, both right. of them are protecting themselves to basically say, you know, get away. I'm vulnerable, but I'm going to make a big noise so that it sounds like I'm, I'm powerful, but not really. Right. And the one other thing to mention here is the syzygy, which is in the middle between the animus and the anima. What syzygy means is yoked together. Ah, good evening, Penelope. Nice to see you tonight. Um, so the anima and the animus are yoked together and they can't get out of it. Okay. That's what syzygy means is that they're both things we're all both things so if you think of the um, yin yang concept in taoism um, it just flows around and 
sometimes you're more masculine and sometimes you're more feminine and vice versa. Um, and, uh, and you're stuck together because you're both in that uh, yin yang wheel mm -hmm. and you can't get out because that's your universe. Um, and, and one last thing I think I'd say about this is I appreciate it as a diagram a great deal, but I think, and this is a, this is just a kind of a Jordan, Jordanian subtlety piece where some people may think I'm splitting a hair, but I think it would be a better diagram if he pulled the, ma the male ego and the female ego down into a curvilinear arc concentric with the self. Because what I find there is that there is really kind of an orbital facet going on here. And putting them in a straight line across the top makes it into just a simple relationship diagram of the right. pieces and parts. But I think that there is kind of a, an orbital piece of how these can be made to overlap by moving them closer and further apart. Right. Well, Edinger did write another book called Ego and Archetype. And in there, he, he did do a diagram such as you're discussing. Right, with um, a top curve uh, yeah. along an arc. And, and putting the ego in the self. And right. then it gradually, gradually emerges just like sunrise. And, and then it sunsets too later in life. Um, yeah, and I think that's, that's an important, the way it moves in and out as well as right. also orbitally around right so the reason overlapping. i the reason i wanted to mention that uh i just want to see what i have in my uh no no i got the wrong thing all right uh the reason i wanted to mention that is because um i think that that's a bit better structure of the unconscious than what Jung himself put in this essay, which is actually, he wrote this essay 30 years before Edinger did his diagram. And so I just don't want us to get too far afield uh, when we get into what Jung was saying in the 19 teens. Let's see, when did when did he write and this? I think that's that's a really good example in itself of you know the purpose of Jung's work is to um, provide access, personally provide access to yourself to the right. nourishing contents of the psyche, and that the diagram of even self awareness of how we are composed psychologically, uh, structurally. Right. So Matthew asks, "What book is the diagram from?" And the diagram is from the Ion Lectures, which uh, Edinger wrote. And it's figure five from the, the Ion Lectures, A-I-O-N Lectures by Edward Edinger. And of course this, um, actually he wrote this structure of the unconscious in 1916, according to this footnote. So um, mm -hmm. therefore he, Jung was writing this essay about 50 years before Edinger wrote any such thing. And, um, and so let, let's just be conscious of, of the fact that this is sort of the old story, but let's read it anyway, because it's part of the collected works. So and I think you made an interesting comment, I think in, in another group last week where, you know, will it take, you know, five or so hundred years to understand Jung. And I think I, you know, I, I disagreed, but I think it, it, I thought about it. I wasn't so much disagreeing. I think there was a different take on it. You were hitting on a point there and it felt like Plato's cave was similar where mm -hmm. in 500 years, we'll still be reading Jung. And in a way, because it's generative. And I think that five, 600 years will give time for, interpretations to come about so we learn a lot more right. i think we get it already i think but it's generative like a symbol well so some we of us some of us get it already that's the issue some of us get it already and in 500 years there's going to be 
um, 25 generations or more. And all those new people that are born into the world are born as wild animals. So they have to build themselves up and build themselves up to the point where they can even be interested in Carl Jung. Mm -hmm. and, and so it does take a long time to pick up on this stuff. Um, right. Only because, uh, you know, I'm 76 years old now. And... Um, you know, there's a limit to how many how many videos I can put on YouTube. I don't know how many that is, but I've already put more than 1,300 of them on YouTube to educate people about Carl Jung. And I suppose these videos will be educating people for probably a century uh, before they're somehow superseded. But um, ultimately, they're only going to reach a few tens of thousands of people maybe and mm -hmm. and so before everybody in the world sort of grocks it it's going to be a while um, right now that that yeah i i, I side there with you yeah, thank you thank you penny uh, penelope i appreciate that uh she says, a role model you are, Skip. <laughs> okay, well, I, I concluded that Carl Jung's work was important about, uh, well, at least 20 years ago. I was reading it up and, well, or, no, let's put it this way. In 2005, I started to read Carl Jung's work directly. Up until that point, for about 17 or 18 years, I had been reading about Carl Jung by people who knew him or had some idea about Jungian psychology. Some of them are very good, like Jean Shinoda Bolin, Clarissa Pincola Estes, many others. And so I was reading sort of peripherally around Jung, and it was only in 2005 that I actually started to read the collected works. So since then, I've read, I've pretty much read the collected works and, um, and they, they don't change my attitude about it, but I realize how important the mainstream, you know, the, the vein of gold that is in Jungian psychology is in the collected works. Mm -hmm. And if you're reading these other books, you're reading about something that's that's in it, but it's it doesn't give you the full picture. And even the red book, I'm learning from reading the, the black books, I'm nearly finished, that even the red book doesn't give you a full picture. You have to read the black books in order to fully appreciate what he was up to. And, and uh, he left this behind. And, you know, I, I couldn't understand why Sonu Shamdasani, who translated the Red Book and published it in 2009, why he would then be willing to spend a whole nother decade translating the Black Books, um, which were Dr. Jung's raw psychological observations from which the red book is based but the answer is in the black books and if you don't read the black books you're never going to really get it but you have to read a lot of young plus the red book before you read the black books or else you'll miss it um, and uh, you have to read all the footnotes okay so now um we are on uh, paragraph 442. We will go to nine o'clock. Uh, so this is uh, part one of this essay called The Structure of the Unconscious. Part one is a, the distinction between the personal and the impersonal unconscious. So 442. Since we parted company with the Vien Viennese school, on the question of the interpretative, interpretive uh, principle in psychoanalysis, namely whether 
it be sexuality or simply energy, our concepts have undergone considerable development. Once the prejudice re regarding the explanatory cause had been removed by accepting a purely abstract one, um, the nature of which was not postulated in advance, our interest was directed to the concept of the unconscious. And I'll stop there just for a minute. So the one of the things that attracted me to learn more about this is I, I wanted as like many men to learn more about sexuality. And I quickly learned that that's just a, a cul-de-sac and it's not the real stuff about our psychic energy. And so what Freud <coughs> insisted was caused only by sexuality. Actually, it's caused by many other things. And so we get our psychic energy, our libido, from many things in our psyches. And so psychic energy rather than circus, sexuality is a more appropriate way of talking about psychology. Okay. Did you I want think to that's correct? And that? I, yeah, I think that's correct. I think, first of all, I think it's interesting that even in the onset of the professional psychiatric and psychological discussion moving to the unconscious, they underwent the you know political red, blue, back and forth civil war of sexuality versus energy. And, you know, the they who doth protest too much proves, you know, it must be sexuality and we shouldn't talk about it either, you know, and then you get the, and then you get the, no, it's energy. So we can talk about that and a lot of other things too. And so then not just energy, it became its own inner world that's connected to a larger uh, collective inner world as it were yeah. and i think that's that's really interesting to me that that back and forth onset happened um just just to bring the abstract concept of the unconscious to the fore which then actually isn't so abstract it's just not so physically tangible okay so if you would have read the next two paragraphs i need to get myself a glass of water or i'm not going to okay. be able to read anymore Paragraph 443. In Freud's view, as most people know, the contents of the unconscious are reducible to infantile tendencies, which are repressed because of their incompatible character. Repression is a process that begins in early childhood under the moral influence of the environment and continues throughout life. By means of analysis, their repressions are removed and the repressed wishes are made conscious again. Theoretically, the unconscious would thus find itself emptied out, so to speak, done away with. But in reality, the production of infantile sexual wish fantasies continues right into old age. And I would just put forth that I don't think so. I think that's an adult version of infantile psychology and psychiatry where until the sexual drive is developed i don't think they are have anything to do with sexual tendencies they simply are need-based but anyway paragraph 444 according to this theory the unconscious would contain only those elements of the personality which could just as well be conscious and have to have in fact been supposed only through the process of education. It follows that the essential content of the unconscious would be of a personal character. Although from one point of view, the infantile tendencies of the unconscious are the most conspicuous, it would nonetheless be a mistake to define or evaluate the unconscious entirely in these terms. The unconscious has still another side to it. It includes not only repressed contents, but also all psychic material that lies below the threshold of consciousness. It is possible to explain the subliminal nature of all this material. It is impossible. It is impossible to, thank you, it is impossible to explain the subliminal nature 
of all this material on the principle of repression. For in that case, the removal of repression ought to endow a person with a prodigious memory, which would thenceforth forget nothing. No doubt repression plays a part, but it is not only it is not the only factor. If what we call a bad memory were always the were always only the result of repression, those who enjoy an excellent memory ought never to suffer from repression, nor in consequence be neurotic. But experience shows that this is not the case at all. There are certainly cases of abnormally bad memory where it is obvious that the lion's share must be attributed to repression, but these are relatively rare. Okay. Um, and I had made a comment on uh, paragraph 443 of um, theoretically, this is from a Freudian uh, perspective, theoretically the unconscious would thus find itself emptied and so to speak done away with. But in reality, the production of infantile sexual wish fantasies continues right into old age. And I feel like that's a superimposed projection of Freud that honestly with infants, with infant psychology and infant psychiatry in the writings and the papers that have been uh, put forth, it's need-based. It has nothing to do with sexuality because it hasn't, that hasn't developed yet. Right. So that and, I think and we have to consciously comment on the fact that we're only talking about stuff that is in here that can become conscious because there are many things that the psyche does probably 90 percent or more of the things that the psyche does uh we're never aware of and we never can can be aware of for example your your body replenishes its uh, cells all of its cells once every seven years as an example except for certain parts of your body like your uh, brain but otherwise all the cells in your body are replaced every seven years all that takes place completely unconsciously normally mm -hmm. your heartbeat takes place completely unconsciously as does your breathing it's only when you think about it that you that you're aware of it um now penelope has made a couple of comments that are astrology related so i'm going to refer refer them to you um she says uh there's a solar eclipse tomorrow I see the libido as Mars and the North Node, Plutonic and Venus. Uh, and, and I guess she agreed to something else you said, but. Um, Could you read that again with the Plutonic? Oh, the whole thing I got okay. the first half. I see the libido as Mars and the North Node, Plutonic and Venus. And so I don't know what she means by that. Um, that would be more like soul, soul purpose, uh, North Node being more of an epochal, E-P-O-C-H-A, or mm -hmm. evolutionary astrology scale that she's referring to, where it's something that's more, um, more natural, but at a larger driving scale, say, for example, the soul. Um, it's interesting that she, she mentions Mars, too, because... It's, it's going retrograde soon um, and after the eclipse. And what's interesting is retrograde simply means stationed and still. So you have to be careful about negative comments. Oh, no, it's gone retrograde. Well, that means to downshift. That means you need to adjust. You can't have the status quo business as usual until you recalibrate. But I like the Plutonic piece you mentioned with Venus, but I would substitute in there Jupiter. Um, mm -hmm. And then put Pluto there on the same diagram, but outside of it, because in the 50s, I think it was um, a professor, uh, Klevikov, I, I, I believe he was in Russia, um, an astronomer made the case that Venus was originally part of Jupiter. And, wow. and to the point that <clears throat> was exiled from academia, they, they you know, made fun of him they i mean they made fun of him this was heresy 
And lo and behold, when the Venus, you know, Venus probe goes in, what do they determine? That um, Venus was originally a part of Jupiter. So, yeah, sure. you know, it's, it's that kind of thing. So you get an inner and outer planet relationship that I think she's bringing up. And the North Node is more of an abstraction that deals more with, I think, soul self or higher self either way. Uh, if I'm in, you know, interpreting what her comment was there. Uh, and the Plutonic piece is depthful. You know, it's, it's you get rulership of, of Scorpio and in one sense from one side and then uh, it's interpreted differently, but Pluto is very much depthful. You know, it's the furthest out, um, the furthest away. And so consequently it would also relate to the furthest in that's the furthest away. Um, and in that sense, Scorpio then goes with very much that depth where we're going to have this eclipse right now. And even the eclipse itself, the light going away, you're going into a, a day, a night coming into a dark, into a day, yeah. you know, just to look at it as an overlappage from an anti, an anti perspective. If that, if that speaks at all to her comment and if not if she could open that up a little bit i think she's got a lot there conceptually right and uh meanwhile let me express my re my regard for astrology which also i think relates to dr jung's regard for astrology which is it doesn't really have anything to do with the planets and stars in the heaven it has to do with the same, but it, but because ancient people referred to those, it became that. But it's actually about how these things interact within the psyche of the human being. And so in a, the, from my point of view, all of these things are true. Okay, they're not woo-you, they're, they're true because... They're within our psyche, and they express things that have been found to be true over thousands of years. And the easiest way I can describe that is if you ever go to a Chinese restaurant and they have your birth year on there, almost always uh, you will find that your birth year, as described, will correspond to your actual character. Uh, so I happen to be a dog ear person, which among other things means that I'm very loyal. And uh, that is the type of person that I like to hope I, I am anyway. <laughs> but I think it's funny when you brought that up before and I'd forgotten what I was and then you know we look it up and then go figure with the beard this year um, i'm a goat and it's like you started laughing and now i can't i can't not laugh every time i see the, the chinese zodiac from the animal's perspective because i keep looking at it just smile it's right like, and well, so and so what happened with the chinese zodiac well people over thousands of years applied these ideas to their children and so that they became true. And they also happen to be true vis-a-vis -vis all of us, regardless of whether we're Chinese or not. Right. And, and that is the amazing thing, that when you connect these things up like that, it is effective and it is useful. Uh, and we need to pay attention to to all these things not a, i only use the chinese zodiac as an example but i'm saying that the uh, western astrology works basically the same way that we convinced ourselves that these things were true and therefore they are <laughs> well and what's interesting is even you get western people who may who especially those who have no uh, interest in astrology they sit down at, at an Asian restaurant and there's that that red placemat and they're immediately curious like kids because it takes you to the zoo oh what animal am I am I 
and oh, and people will deny it, and then their wife will turn around. Oh no, no, that pegged you pretty well. And, <laughs> and, or or the wife will say, oh no, no, and you know he'll he'll he or she will you know say, oh oh no, no, that 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 pegged you pretty well. And so at the very least, it creates this levity and and really a, an enlightened conversation. They're actually right. talking about themselves in a way that's structurally a learning experience not right. talking about themselves in an egomaniacal way there's a learning about themselves from each other so you right. get the third person perspective and you're over a meal too so the thing about people um we're not sitting there fighting over the elk you know right. and <laughs> so a lion won't have a very good conversation over dinner um it'll be <laughs> growling and go away and whereas people we sit down and actually kind of relax when we're eating and i think it's because intuitively we're not hunting anymore it's like oh we can take a break because now we can reap the reward as it would be so penelope says i am a horse and uh i can well imagine that penelope horses are quite beautiful uh nice and i'll leave it at that okay Uh, I will read the next two paragraphs. Um, We therefore affirm that in addition to the repressed material, the unconscious contains all those psychic components that have fallen below the threshold, as well as the subliminal sense perceptions. Moreover, we know from abundant experience, as well as from for theoretical reasons, that besides this, the unconscious contains all the material that has not yet reached the threshold of consciousness. These are the seeds of future conscious contents. Equally, we have every reason to suppose that the unconscious is never quiescent in the sense of being inactive, but presumably is ceaselessly engaged in the groupings and regroupings of so-called unconscious fantasies. This activity should be thought of as relatively autonomous only in pathological cases. Normally, it is coordinated with consciousness in a compensatory relationship. I think we better comment on that point. Um, In other words, people who have um, mental disease or defect can have... um, relatively autonomous um, complexes, et cetera. Whereas normal people, ordinary people, um, what happens is that your psyche compensates for if you get out of whack, you'll get a dream that's opposite that. And that that dream compensates and somehow maintains our mental balance. I just mentioned that. Going on, uh, paragraph 446, it is to be assumed that all these contents are of a personal nature insofar as they are acquired during the individual's life. Since this life is limited, the number of acquired contents in the unconscious must also be limited. This being so, it might be thought possible to empty the unconscious either by analysis or by making a complete inventory of the unconscious contents on the ground that the unconscious cannot produce anything more than what is already known and assimilated into consciousness. We should also have to suppose, as we have said, that if one could arrest the descent of conscious contents into the unconscious by doing away with repression, unconscious productivity uh, would be paralyzed. This is possible only to a very limited extent. As we know from experience, we urge our patients to hold fast to repressed contents that have been reassociated with consciousness and to assimilate them into their plan of life. But this procedure, as we have daily, as we may daily convince ourselves, makes no impression on the unconscious, since it calmly goes on producing apparently the same infantile sexual fantasies, which, according to the earlier theory, 
should be the effects of personal repressions. If in such cases the analysis be continued systematically, one uncovers little by little a medley of incom in incompatible wish fantasies of a most surprising compensate composition. Uh, besides all the sexual perversions, one finds every conceivable kind of criminality, as well as the noblest deeds and the lawfully, loftiest ideas imaginable, the existence of which one would never have suspected in the subject under analysis. Okay, Jordan, you want to comment on that? Yeah, that, that reminds me, too, of people say, well, you shouldn't use that word. And I used to always say, well, that word is in the dictionary. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, I think the mind can be quite a dictionary. And just because we have a content doesn't mean it's something that we resonate with or that yeah. we utilize to activate, to act upon. But so that there, I think all the potentialities of all the personalities, maybe not in every psyche, but in a great deal, these groupings and regroupings that occur that make personality, um, just the neurobiology of self um, kind of thing that put that construct together, I think are all present. So in a sense, like a, a whole dictionary of words, but with the language that you speak, you use your particular larger grouping of words, but maybe not all 50,000 or 500,000, depending on which dictionary you're using. Well, and uh, here in this section, we have one of my kvetches about this particular essay, which was written over 100 years ago, in that it doesn't really cover the unconscious as it relates to our physiology. It relates only to what's kind of in the head type of psyche. But right. what, this, this, what we've learned is that there are things going on in our body that also relate to the unconscious. For example, uh, the mechanism that uh, tells our heart to beat, okay, mm -hmm. which is an electrical impulse, and it does not come from the brain. We know this because uh, when we install a pacemaker and tell the heart when to beat uh, because of the pacemaker, because someone old has a heart that doesn't tell it when to beat properly anymore. Uh, that isn't in the head. The, the, the nece necessity to have a pacemaker is in the, <laughs> in the area of the heart. It isn't in the area of the head. Uh, comment, Jordan. Well, and they've discovered more than, I think, 40,000 neurons and brain cells that are in the heart itself. So they're the heart is a very peculiar organ um, in that it used to be, oh, you know, the heart's all feeling and the head's all thinking. Well, they're both both and, but it's like the heart has the small brain in it and the head has the small heart, as it were, in it. Um, just for example, you, you can't feel pain in your brain. Um, yeah. But if you see someone get a concussion in real time, on, on infrared, mm -hmm. you see the, the blood come out mm -hmm. of the corpus, the brain yeah. itself. And it's interesting then because that which is uh, discerning pain, as it were, or sensations does not itself feel those things. So it's in right. a sense, the brain is kind of an unbiased survival mechanism where whether you want it to feel that way or not, it will feel that way um yeah. so i think so it's interesting quickly though i think interesting yeah. that the unconscious is infinite i mean right. we can't we can't empty it out any more than we could empty empty the ocean with a spoon absolutely you know? so it, and and as we showed in that diagram it goes to the whole of space time ultimately now uh jordan i'd like to get through uh, to this part two. Uh, right. So would you read the next two paragraphs? Two. Yeah. Paragraph 447. By way of example, I would like to recall the case of a schizophrenic patient of Mater's 
who used to declare that the world was his picture book. He was a wretched locksmith's apprentice who, apprentice who fell ill at an early age and had never been blessed with much intelligence. This notion of his, that the world was his picture book, the leaves of which he was turning over as he looked around him, is exactly the same as Schopenhauer's world as will and idea, but expressed in primitive picture language. His, vi his vision is just as sublime as Schopenhauer's, the only difference being that with the patient, it remained at an embryonic stage, whereas in Schopenhauer, the same idea is transformed from a vision into an abstraction and expressed into a language that is universally valid. Paragraph 448. It would, it would be quite wrong to suppose that the patient's vision had a personal character and value, for that would be to then endow the patient with the dignity of a philosopher. But as I have indicated, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but as I have indicated, he alone is a philosopher who can determine, who can transmute a vision born of nature into an abstract idea, thereby translating it into a universally universally valid language. Schopenhauer's philosophical conception represents a personal value, but the vision of the patient is an impersonal value, a merely natural growth, the proprietary right to which can be acquired only by him who abstracts it into an idea and expresses it in universal terms. It would, however, be wrong to attribute to the philosopher by exaggerating the value of his achievement or there it's her achievement, the additional merit of having actually created or invented the vision itself. It is a primordial idea that grows up quite as naturally in the philosopher and is simply a part of the common property of mankind in which, in principle, everyone has a share. The golden apples drop from the same tree, whether they be gathered by a locksmith's apprentice or by a Schopenhauer. Right. Um, I heard, I, I'll just make a side comment here, that Jordan Peterson made the observation in a recent video, I don't ex exactly know when he did it, but recently, where he said that we think in images and in words, okay, he's not right about that, because um Words are images, <laughs> okay? And so, so we think in images and words are images of an idea or a something, but they are not that something typically. Um, and I think his statement is limited to himself because I know plenty of mathematicians that literally, and I don't mean arithmetic i mean math math they're they're thinking in differential equations and differential equations are just letters and larger words they're using and so that's not to transliterate that into that's those are words too i think that's a real limiting way to look at how we think and i've noticed lately he's been a lot more um assertive which to me is feeling like he's a lot more uncomfortable um so anyway, that's just my perspective. Yeah, I think he's been called on a bunch of stuff uh, over the recent months. Yeah, and, he feels and a little shell shocked. Yeah, and he and fair enough, he deserves it. Okay, four forty nine. This primordial uh, these primordial ideas of which I have given a great many examples in my work on libido, oblige one to make in regard to unconscious material a distinction of quite a different character from the, that between pre-conscious and unconscious or subconscious and unconscious. The justification for the, these distinctions need not be discussed here. I, oh, I hate it when he does that. Right, right, right. <laughs> and they, they have their specific value and are well worth elaborating further as points of view. The fundamental distinction which experience has forced upon me claims to be no more than that. I should be, uh, it should be evident from the foregoing that we have no, dis we have to distinguish 
in the unconscious a layer which may call we may call the personal unconscious. The contents of this layer are of a personal nature insofar as they have the character partly of acquisitions derived from the individual's life and partly of psychological factors, which could just as well be conscious. Um, yeah. And it's footnote too about that last line of psycho psychological factors. For instance, repressed wishes or tendencies that are incompatible with the moral or aesthetic sentiments of the subject. Meaning they go counter grain to the way you are. Yeah. Um, Shall I 450? Or well, you, uh, you can, but let me just mention one other thing. So what this idea of layers in the unconscious is significant. Okay. And if you're studying Jungian psychology, you should try to understand what layer he's talking about. Because yes, there is a layer in your personal unconscious um, that you're not thinking of at the moment. But if I, um, if I mention the word elephant, for example, you're going to think of all the, all the ways that you've been involved with elephants, one, uh, even if, if it's at the zoo or in a book. Um, and none of those will be the same as, the, as my relationships with elephants. And so, um, yes, there is a personal layer. Uh, and it's important to understand that deeper layers are primordial. They come to all of us, all human beings. And sometimes they're activated by events that occur in the, in the world, okay? And Dr. Jung did talk about these things at length later on in his career. So this is one of the points in this uh, book where I think this is a, just a bit old and well, yeah, and I think the layering piece is important just from Nietzsche's phrase of if you if one gazes long enough to the, into the abyss, the abyss gazes back. Sure. So if you just glance over it, it's not going to give you the time of day. But if you right. if you meditate and you gaze in deeply, you will penetrate deeper and deeper into different layers and levels. And then what I love is the joke that is played on that quote of Yes, that's true. If you gaze long enough into the abyss, the abyss will gaze back. But at one point, if you gaze too long, the abyss will just bark out that it's rude to stare. <laughs> <laughs> Say it again, Jordan. The if, abyss will just... Oh, if you gaze too long, the abyss will just bark out. It's rude to stare. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> right. Okay, go ahead with this last paragraph then. Or Paragraph 450. <clears throat> it can readily be understood that incompatible psycho psychological elements are liable to repression and therefore become unconscious. But this implies the, po the possibility, on the other hand, of making and keeping the repressed contents conscious once they have been recognized. We recognize them as personal contents because their effects or their partial manifestation or their source can be discovered in our personal past. They are integral components of the personality. They belong to its inventory and their loss to consciousness produces an infer inferiority in one, one respect or another. This inferiority has the psychological, be psychological character, not so much of an organic lesion or an inborn defect as of a lack of which as of a lack of yeah, no of as of a lack which oh yeah of a lack which it, sorry i kept yeah. jumping lines yeah. as a as a lack which gives rise to a feeling of moral resentment the sense of moral inferiority always indicates that the missing element is something which to judge by this feeling about it really ought not to be missing or which could be made conscious if only one took sufficient trouble the moral inferiority does not come from a collision with the generally accepted and, in a sense, arbitrary moral flow, but from the conflict with one's own self. 
which for reasons of psychic equilibrium demands that the deficit be, re be redressed. Whenever a sense of moral infer inferiority appears, it indicates not only a need to assimilate an unconscious component, but also the possibility of such assimilation. In the last resort, it is a man's moral qualities which force him, either through direct recognition of the need or indirectly through a painful neurosis, to assimilate his unconscious self and keep himself fully conscious. Whoever progresses along this path of self-realization must inevitably bring into consciousness the contents of their personal unconscious, thus enlarging considerably the scope of their personality. Right. <coughs> to which I would just say, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. So perfect timing. Uh, we're going to close for tonight. Um, so we finished on paragraph 450. 450. And uh, in future weeks, we are, our target is paragraph 521. Um, and so uh, we still have a ways to go, but we did make some progress tonight and we will continue next week on part two of this particular sub essay, which part two is phenomena resulting from the assimilation of the unconscious. And um, I think we got some good, good progress tonight. It just is, these are, I'm glad we're, we're addressing the appendices because um, these are actually, it feels like these are articles that just didn't make print. And I, I think because they're more than clarifications. Yeah. Um, but we do find even those places where, you know, the justification for these distinctions need not be discussed here. I'm like, oh, come on, give us another appendix. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. Right. And, <laughs> and, you know, just what I wanted was the justification. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. It's like, well, wait, wait. Yeah, it's easy for you, but you know, what what went into that ease for you? Thirty right. years of X, Y, or Z. Yes, uh, and Penelope, thank you for your super chat here tonight. I appreciate that very much. It's even in pounds, which might still have some value in the in the current uh, British economy. <laughs> so. I hope so. If nothing else, they sound heavy, you know. Yeah, they so. sound heavy. They, if a pound used to be equal to five dollars, as I recall, in my lifetime. Uh, and uh, so she says, a coffee for both of you. So I'm, I'm committed to get you, getting you at least a coffee, Jordan, at some point. Um, nice. We'll Thank figure you. out a way to do that. Um, and. Uh, and Leon says, thanks, guys. Good night. So thank you all. We'll be continuing on with this Appendix 2 to two essays on analytical psychology next week. And so Sounds thank, good. thank you for being here. It'll be the last day of October and it will be Halloween. So nice. what, could, what could possibly go wrong? That... <laughs> we, we, Actually, that's. We have a community where there are mostly old people, so we don't get any trick or treaters anymore. Um, but I might and I'm going to need to school. check if we have an event on the plaza with uh, bon might. with bonfires. Yeah. That night. It may be done on Saturday. I'm not. I need to check. That yeah. I laugh that that's so far in the future. Not anymore. <laughs> yeah, like, it's not far in the future. This week. Well, it, I will try to uh, muddle through uh, next week, but I do urge everyone to um, possibly join our panel so we have more people to talk to. And um, it would be very kind if you would do that uh, because Jordan and I have been carrying the flag here for a couple of years. And, you know, occasionally we do get people on and we get great comments. And we always get people on our advanced reading group on Wednesdays. Um, but that is not publicly made available at the moment. Um, 
Oh, yeah, I appreciate it when we have more people too, because it literally is the more the merrier because people will hear things differently with their different perspective and bring up things that you or I might not. And I think that, that makes the, the discussion, the conversation more robust in regards to discussing these topics. Right. Okay. So on the, um, on the YouTube channel now, I'm going to put the link uh, to the um, mailing list, the MailChimp mailing list, uh, so that if you would like to join any of our groups for further discussion with us um, in the panels, uh, of course, you, your image and voice may be heard conceivably on YouTube. Uh, however, if you keep your, you can be here with us, and if you keep your uh, camera off, your video off, uh, like this, uh, then um, you won't be seen, and you can keep your uh, microphone muted, except when you want to throw popcorn at us. So I urge you to... <laughs> I urge you to join us uh, any Monday night or any Sunday morning or join our advanced reading group, which is now on Wednesdays at 4 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. Uh, so anyway, thank you, Jordan, for tonight. And Definitely. if you are not here, I will muddle through for uh, another portion of it. And I'll let you know, I just realized I had to turn ahead in my schedule book and I have a lot of holes that I need to fill in this week that uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> they're in my notes and they're not in the, oh, I'm going to show up actually. So, yeah. Okay. So see you next week, everyone. And thank you for being here. And thank you, especially.